Thank you, Bob. The banjo was a nice surprise. Love that. Love that. So I would like to introduce you to Edna. Edna is 68 years old. She's married to Fred, who worked at the Boeing plant down in Chester for nearly 30 years before his COPD got really bad. Edna works at the giant supermarket on Baltimore Pike. Most days, you'll find her at the self-checkout, wiping down the machines and helping customers when their groceries don't scan properly or their credit cards don't go through. Edna has to stand for her entire shift, which aggravates her sciatica. Her gallbladder has flare-ups now and again, but she can't call in sick because she needs this job. Edna has worked for Giant for the past seven years, and she's just about at the top of the pay scale for her position, pulling in nearly $10 an hour. Edna likes the interactions she has with customers, at, at least most of them, and the other cashiers, most of whom are young enough to be her grandchildren. But she would prefer not to work. She worries about Fred just about every minute of every day, and she'd rather be home taking care of him. But Medicare doesn't fully cover their prescriptions, and her job pays for their supplemental plan. She probably should see the doctor about her gallbladder, but she's worried about being told she'll need surgery. She, she just can't be laid up because the bills would just pile up and they'd never get out from under them. Edna's kids do what they can. Her daughter brings the two grandkids over one night a week, along with a meal for all of them. Once a month, her son sorts through their finances. Edna knows that he secretly makes occasional deposits into their bank account to keep their heads above water, but neither of them talks about it because it would embarrass them both. This isn't the picture Edna had of what retirement would look like. That cabin by the lake in the Poconos that she and Fred dreamed about all those years is just going to have to remain a dream. Now I'd venture to guess that every supermarket in America has an Edna, probably several Ednas. And it's great that these companies employ them. But for Edna or anyone in their position to have to work so that they can afford medical care demonstrates just how broken our system is. And while Edna isn't working in a sweatshop in 115 degree heat 12 hours a day, like workers were back when Labor Day was established, there are Americans working under brutal conditions for paltry wages still to this day, 126 years after Congress established a national holiday honoring all workers. I think it's particularly important this year to reclaim the origins of Labor Day, a meaning that's been lost to the end of summer picnics and barbecues, in a year when unemployment has spiked and where so many frontline workers have been risking their lives so the rest of us can stay safe from the ravages of the pandemic. I'm talking about all the Ednas who've kept working in the supermarkets when we were too afraid to venture out. All the home grocery delivery workers whom we paid to shop so that we didn't have to. All the postal workers, the UPS and FedEx drivers and the Amazon employees who sorted our orders and loaded up their trucks every day and made their runs so that our needs and wants could still be met from the safety of our own homes. Those who pick and process the crops, many of whom are immigrants and day laborers, all so that we can eat. All the sanitation workers who collected our trash like they have every week as if it didn't contain traces of a virus they could pick up with it. The nursing aides and orderlies and hospital janitorial staff who stared down this vicious virus on a daily basis, often for a measly 7.25 an hour. 
all these people and so many more have kept working throughout the pandemic so that we could continue to live, to shelter in place and to stay safe. We literally owe them our lives. In case you doubt me or believe that I'm overstating the case, take a look at what happened in Upper Darby last month. For two weeks after a sanitation worker was diagnosed with COVID-19, all trash pickups were suspended. Garbage piled up on the streets of that community, attracting rats and other vermin, putting the health of an entire township at risk. And so, on this Labor Day 2020, I want to take time to recognize all those hourly and low-wage workers, workers who, by the way, are predominantly people of color and at much higher risk of contracting coronavirus than the rest of us, and to honor them for everything they do. There's been a lot of talk about heroes in the face of the pandemic these past few months, and a case could be made for the Ednas of the world to be put into that category. And believe me, I would be the first in line to donate to a monument for these frontline workers. But to apply the appellation of hero to them implies that they had a choice. Heroism connotes the decision of the person to act in a selfless way, often at risk or without regard to their own personal safety. The risk of calling frontline workers heroes is that it allows us to ignore or to gloss over the fact that in most cases, because of the way the system is rigged against them, these people didn't and don't have a choice. They have to put their own lives at risk because if they don't, they won't be able to feed their families or get even the minimum level of health care any human being deserves. Now, I'm guessing that the Ednas of this world appreciate our nice words of honor and recognition, our thoughts and prayers, and I'm guessing they would appreciate even more some meaningful labor reforms that are long overdue. Reforms like raising the minimum wage from its abhorrent and unlivable $7.25 to $15 an hour, and instituting mandatory paid sick and, and family leave, and establishing a single-payer health care system that doesn't link availability of health insurance to ongoing employment. I mourn the death of the modern labor movement that started with Eugene Debs and the railroad workers and others back in the late 19th century and the power that it conferred on the average worker. The so-called little guys, as frontline low-wage workers were called back then, were given a voice by organizing and, they, and they've lost that voice as 21st century robber barons have quashed all efforts to revive them. But then, then just a couple of weeks ago, we were offered a glimmer of hope and it came from such an unexpected place. The NBA Players Union, a consortium of highly paid athletes who decided to use their power to stand up to, stand up to the, ra the racial injustices in this country. And while the NBA Players Union is comprised of one percenters, and there isn't a single little guy among them, either in stature or in bank account, we witness the power of organized labor to actually get something done. Maybe, just maybe, this will filter down to where it's needed most. At least we can hope. One of the principles on which our faith is founded is our commitment to promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Let us, on this Labor Day, recommit ourselves to all those who work so that we may live. As we approach an election, we can commit to working for and voting for those candidates who advocate for a living wage and health care for all. We can support organizations like Raise the Wage PA and UU Plan in the work that they do. And when we see Edna, whatever Edna's name may be, when we see Edna at the supermarket, we can take a moment to glance at her name tag, look her in the eye, call her by her name, and say thank you 
for all you do. This day and every day, I wish you peace. Amen.